Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and once again I'm going to be playing Ultimate General Gettysburg here. This is the second part of my Let's Play series, uh, or After Action Report, however you like to refer to these types of things. In the first part, uh, we fought the morning action on McPherson's and Seminary Ridge. We drove the Union off of Oak Ridge, which is just to the north of Seminary Ridge. We also took Oak Hill. And we held on to Hare's Ridge, uh, which is further west, and you start with that position. Uh, we were not able to take Seminary Ridge as a part of uh, the actual battle. And you can see here, this is the second battle. This kind of has a dynamic campaign. It's all part of one battle, but it's dynamic in the sense that your follow-on battles are reflected, are in influenced by what happens originally. So you can see here, it tells us the scenario that we just came from. Confederates capture Oak Hill and Oak Ridge and then gives you the uh, force summary here. One thing I want to kind of keep an eye on, which I haven't really been able to look at, is do casualties carry over battle to battle? That would be really cool if they did, but I haven't been able to really keep an eye on that. I've been a little bit busy with other other things. I'll run a few tests later, uh, maybe once I get through the campaign and answer that question in a later video. Um, but yeah, anyway, so let's see here. Uh, the scenario is going to give us the scenario down here where you can see the Union starts with about 17,000 soldiers, 42 guns. We start with only 4,300 soldiers. That's basically General Heath's division, or what would be left of it by this point, and 24 guns. We have 19,392 soldiers as reinforcements with 43 guns coming in. So we will outnumber the Union once our reinforcements arrive. It is 1,400 hours. I believe the last scenario ended at 13-something. Uh, so you can see the, the battle starts after the, the previous one ends. Um, and then I'll read the, the write-up, and then we'll get into the fight. So it says, we've seized the Lutheran sem Seminary, which we didn't take at the end of that battle, so the Union must have withdrawn because we had taken Oak Hill and Oak Ridge. The position was probably untenable. So the Union has withdrawn from Seminary Ridge overlooking Gettysburg. The Yankees have lost their foothold on the town itself, and the enemy has been driven driven from the town to the southern hills. Oh, I'm sorry. We've, I'm going to just read this because it makes no sense if I paraphrase because apparently I don't understand things. It says, We've seized the Lutheran Seminary overlooking Gettysburg and the Union have lost their foothold on the town. With the enemy driven from the town to the south, southern hills, we'll be able to secure the town in preparation for our next attack on their positions. We're massing our forces against the town. General Ewell's 2nd Corps has arrived to support us. Our next step should be to advance south again. We should not lose the momentum we have, but the Union 11th Corps has arrived. So originally it was just some Union cavalry in the 1st Corps under General Reynolds. Uh, now it's the Union 1st and 11th Corps along with some cavalry against our own 1st Corps or Heath's division and perhaps Pender's division coming up from Hill's 1st Corps and the, or 3rd Corps and then the 2nd Corps under General Yule which is arriving. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and fight. You can see here right away General Rhodes' division is uh, arriving so that's part of Yule's division or Yule's 2nd Corps. You can see quite a few reinforcements up here coming on the field right to start. Um... It doesn't look like the enemy has actually been driven from all of Seminary Ridge. So we took part of the seminary, I guess, but not the actual ridge. Uh, which, again, reflects the actual position that we had. Uh, it doesn't look like the town has any defensive value. You can see Culp's Hill. The enemy doesn't have troops there because it's blue, but they, it's not dark blue. That means they don't occupy it. Cemetery Hill is worth 4,000 points, and Seminary Ridge is worth 1,500. So the enemy still holds the southern portion of Seminary Ridge. We definitely want to take that so we can swing east. We also want to try and secure Cemetery Hill and now Culp's Hill, which the Union has taken. Uh, these battles move pretty quick here, so we've got reinforcements coming in. I'm going to form up for an attack on Seminary Ridge first. That's the most important position to take right this moment. We should have some time later in the day, if we don't take it, uh, that we can go ahead and assault Culp's Hill and Cemetery's Hill and all that. Looks like we've got P Pender's Division uh, coming in to play as well. So I'm just getting my forces lined up uh, in what would be a, a good solid line position. Not too uh, creative, if you will. Just kind of going to be a straight solid line. Going to move my artillery up here on this ridge. Looks like we've got quite a few troops coming in, so we're going to kind of form up as best we can against these Union positions. Again, we have to move quickly because these battles do move very, very fast. I'm not sure where these artillery pieces are going to go, but we can see Pender's guys are coming in. We'll form up along McPherson's Ridge here, which is the opposite of, of uh, 
seminary ridge so then we can go ahead and, and be in position to launch an attack hopefully on their f their front and flank and overwhelm them and easily easily take the uh, the ground we're gonna move artillery up to the high ground here I'm not sure what to do with Heath's skirmishers I guess we can move them forward and start skirmishing with the enemy up there because one of the key things I want to use is I want to use Seminary Ridge at the height here to bombard Cemetery Hill. It's got a good line of sight. Seminary Ridge is actually where the Confederate artillery was stationed on July 3rd when they pounded Union positions along the stone wall here along Cemetery Hill, along Cemetery Ridge on July 3rd uh, when Pickett's Charge occurred. So that's going to be a good position for us to occupy in order to assault uh, Cemetery Ridge hill later this battle. Hopefully this battle, I guess it depends on how much time we have. So again, trying to form up forces to the front. We're getting some troops into the town. There was some city fighting which did occur early on, uh, or in the afternoon on July 1st. Historically the Union held their position against Heath, and then as Pender came up the Confederates assaulted and then uh, Ewell's Corps came down on the flank, crushed the Union flank around this area, the Penn College kind of area coming down this road, Railroad Pike. Uh, the Union retreated t through the city of Gettysburg, or the town of Gettysburg, to Cemetery Hill late on July 1st. Obviously we've met with a little bit more success than was the case historically. Early's division is coming to aid us as well, so we've got another whole division of troops coming down, uh, which could attack um, Culp's Hill and get us around the Union flank and make their position on Cemetery Hill untenable. Again, I'm just trying to form up a solid line here. We'll get his boys moving quick. The AI that I have selected in this game is cautious, so they're ba or, sorry, they're cunning. So basically, they're very. It's a very good quality AI, or very difficult, if you will, but the AI is also um, not going to rush attack you. They're going to be more passive. I chose that AI uh, because I believe it's more historically in keeping uh, with the actual Battle of Gettysburg, where the Union was pretty passive, with the exception of General Sickles, uh, who was a little bit rash. My troops are moving into position here. I'm not going to wait for the artillery. I'm just going to go for it. Because really the main point for the artillery is to get them up on cemetery or seminary ridge. I always get cemetery and seminary ridge confused. One's with a C, one's with an S, obviously. And I don't want to attack Cemetery Hill directly until we've got Yule's forces up. Again, officers are important as they really boost the morale. You can see Pettigrew has 100% morale while these other troops do not, uh, mainly because Hill is so close. I wonder if the AI can only, or the, the commander can only aid one soldier, th or one unit though. Because it seems like other units are in range and they don't get that boost. Quickly driving the Federals back here. You can see we've already routed their one, their one of their flanks here. Looks like multiple of their regiments are pulling out already. Iron Brigade is in the thick of the fighting again, as usual. As was the case historically. We've got some artillery batteries up here on McPherson's Ridge that are aiding in the attack. I'm mainly moving Dole's brigade in here as, as support. I don't actually want them to advance. Again, I don't want to attack Cemetery Hill directly. O'Neill's forces need, uh, need better morale. I was trying to advance on the flank, but it did expose me to the artillery fire on Cemetery Hill. You definitely don't want to let artillery fire into the side of your unit, because then the artillery round basically is assured to hit your positions. Uh, because it just basically, you know, if, if it's long, you still got more men there. If you aim short, it misses, but if you can aim for the kind of middle of their lines, and if it's short, it still hits some troops. If it's long, it still hits some troops, because you're basically firing down a straight line. And that makes artillery far more uh, deadly and dangerous. Again, just trying to evict the Union troops off a of cemetery, or seminary ridge right now. And see, we've 
pushed back their skirmishers on their other flank. I'm trying to go for a double envelopment, but with their position on Cemetery Hill, that probably won't happen. We are steadily pushing them back, though, so that's a good thing. There's not a whole lot of cover, though, so I'm basically... Uh, Pickett's charge on July 3rd was a charge across, or a advance across this area of ground, which is about a mile across, um, in which Union artillery just devastated Confederate troops moving across the open. Definitely don't want to reenact that. I don't have a whole lot of cover here, so I want to kind of try and keep my boys glued to Seminary Ridge. I think casualties do carry over, because some of these numbers, like, there's no way Pettigrew's lost a thousand men in this short of a battle already. So I definitely think there are carryover casualties, so that's a really cool feature. I really like that aspect of this game. It really makes the decisions you make early in the battle far more significant, if you have to worry about what you're going to be able to fight with on the next fight, if these casualties all carry over, which they definitely, like I said, they appear to. And the, uh, the results of the battle are very dynamic in that, you know, obviously what happens in one battle affects what happens in the next. So it looks like we've got the enemy position. We're pretty steadily pushing them back. Some of these guys don't have a whole lot of cover. Hayes Brigade over there onto Benner Hill. Yule up here. And then I'm going to launch an attack on Culp's Hill. We can take Culp's Hill that gets us astride the entire Union flank, and Cemetery Hill becomes caught in a salient. Uh, salient is a very dangerous position to be in as a defender, because essentially what happens is you've got a very narrow front where your troops are all spread out along this way, and they can only kind of fire at what's directly in front of them, so you have a limited amount of firepower per, fer per square foot. But when you can wrap around their lines the other way, then you can have converging fire on one focal point on the edge of that a salient where you've got three or four guys firing for every one guy that's firing against you. And again here you can see Pettigrew's troops are losing pretty heavy casualties. Um, they've already lost 1,200 men throughout the battle, so uh, I can't tell for sure, but I believe that definitely is going to impact their ability to fight effectively because they've already lost so many men. I'm going to start moving the artillery up here. We're probably a ways through this fight. Now that green bar is going across the top. I don't know if that's like a halfway mark because I never see the battle end at the end of that. But it does say battle delayed usually when it gets there. So I'm thinking the battle could be almost over. Or it, it could, it might not be. It, it, it's hard to say. So we're going to start moving our artillery up here even though there's still some infantry fights going on them up onto Seminary Ridge, hopefully in some positions where they'll have good lines of sight, so then they can support an attack on Cemetery Hill. It's only 1, 130 right now, it's 517, so it means we should have some time still. With the AI that I have selected, it definitely means there's a risk of an enemy, uh, you know, attacking where they think they have an advantage. You can see Schleffing, or whatever his name is, uh, Brigade is advancing against Smith. So if they're going to do that, I'm going to go ahead and advance my own troops in an attack on Culp's Hill. If this is the only brigade they have over there, they're going to be in trouble. See here, we still have more artillery back here that we can bring forward. I don't know if units start in the same positions they end their last fight in. That I can't tell. I don't think they do exactly. They may though. I'll have to keep an eye on that. Maybe I maybe I'll screenshot the end of this end of this battle and see what happens here. I think the Iron Brigade is pretty much done. They're down to 500 men, less than 500 men. The first days, or the first battle that we fought, casualties were pretty even across the board. Gordon's Brigade's firing into this artillery unit here, Wilkinson's. 
Slaflamengwamwamwamwam, I can't pronounce his name, has been driven back. So Culp's Hill is now open if I want to take it. Or at least close to being open. Which it's great that they advanced on me because they kind of worsened their position. Culp's Hill was an incredibly wooded terrain and uh, very difficult to attack against. The Confederates launched numerous attacks to basically no success. Um, the Union very heavily fortified it. So whether we take Cemetery Hill here or not, um, being able to take Culp's Hill would be big. It would completely compromise their position on Cemetery Hill. You can see here now we've got the, these artillery units up on this ridge. They're firing into the Union troops kind of in this open terrain. I'm thinking we might be just about ready for an assault here. Got just about everyone in position, so we'll go ahead and do that. We may actually win a major victory here. already got Iverson's men. We can advance Gordon's men. We're already kind of advancing on the flank of Cemetery Hill. I thought the I thought the Union had more men than this with the 11th Corps. I haven't seen a whole lot of units that I think are part of the 11th Corps. I guess there's the 11th Corps right there who was commanded by General Hooker. Be interesting if this had happened historically if, um, if the 11th would have been made the scapegoats that they were. Uh, at the Battle of Chancellor, yeah, Chancellorsville, just a few months prior in May of 1863. The 11th Corps was positioned on the far end of the Union line. General Jackson in his final battle launched a brilliant flanking maneuver around the Union line and hit them on the end. So basically he had a long line of troops facing just the very narrow end of their the entire line. Ended up routing the 11th Corps, driving it from the field, nearly routing and driving the entire Union army from the field, winning a pretty big victory for the Confederacy. Uh, Jackson was actually accidentally shot by his own men later in the fight, but um, the 11th Corps was used as the scapegoat. They were blamed for the entire failure of the army. Now, there is some blame to be had at the command, but the blame largely lie, lay with um, American soldiers or Union soldiers criticizing the, German eth the ethnically German soldiers who made up a large percentage of the 11th Corps. It was disproportionately made up of immigrants from Germany. Many who came over uh, during the, 19, or the 1848 rebellions in Prussia. And um, the 11th Corps was kind of used as the scapegoat because it's always easier to... Cannot, not always, but it's easy to label someone as the other and blame them for, for a problem. And in this case, the 11th Corps was blamed for the failure, whether it was theirs or not. Again, um, I'm not a professor in Civil War studies. I would certainly say the responsibility lies with the commander of the 11th Corps, but it also lay with General Hooker, who is in commander of the Union Army as well. Um, but again, a disproportionate amount of blame was placed on the um, ethnically German soldiers, and uh, something similar happened at Gettysburg, where the 11th Corps came up to assist the 1st, which was fighting along Seminary Ridge. Uh, the 1st, uh, or the 11th Corps, positioned here on the end, was put in pretty pretty poor terrain. It was kind of very open, as you can see up here, and the uh, con the, un the Confederates ended up just being lucky to be marched down, marching down this road here, right around the Union flank, and routed the Union on the first day of Gettysburg, so that the um, 11th was routed from the field, and they, they reformed here around Cemetery Hill, where they are right now in this battle. You can see the Union has driven back a couple of my brigades here on, under Pettigrew and O'Neill. Um, but the Union was driven from the field. The commander of the 1st Corps uh, was kind of regarded as the hero for Gettysburg because Reynolds' 1st Corps came up and saved the day. They arrived just in time to prevent General Buford's force from being pushed from the field. Um, and what that meant basically was that the 1st Corps was being viewed as, as fighting very, very nobly and, and they were not directly defeated in the flanking assault. The 11th Corps was defeated by being basically outflanked. And again, you know, some blame definitely lies with Hooker, uh, or not Hooker, with Howard, who was the commander of the 11th Corps for putting his posi his army into that position, but he had to form up on the right of, of the 1st Corps uh, in order to protect their flank. And it was probably too long of a position to be defended by a corps of his size. They were flanked again, and they became scapegoats. And even though the Battle of Gettysburg ended as a Union victory, once again the German soldiers were vilified and demonized as being, you know, uh, very poor soldiers and being, you know, again, scapegoated. Um, it was interesting that shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg, when the Union needed reinforcements in the Western Theater at the Siege of Chattanooga, 
uh, 20,000 soldiers were sent from the Army of the Potomac, and it, the 11th Corps made up a large percentage of those reinforcements being shipped off. The Eastern Front was kind of the, the headline front, if you will, uh, in the war. It was, it was where most of the headlines were made, even if the Western Front was just as, if not more important in terms of a, a tactical or strategic sense. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, demoting, demoting those soldiers from kind of major leagues down to AAA is kind of the thought. Uh, basically, get them out of the headlines, get them out of the way, get them out of there for getting, you know, bad press. Let's, let's ship them off. Let's blame them for these, these problems. But uh, I may talk about that a little bit more in the next video here. I don't want to go on too long because you can see here the battle did end in a minor victory for us. We took Seminary Ridge, we continued to hold Oak Ridge, and we took Culp's Hill. We lost about 2,400 soldiers. The Union lost about 2,500, but they maintained holding Cemetery Hill. So it's the kind of midday. It's about, what, 4.30 now? So we'll probably have one more fight, I would imagine, on July 1st. Um, yep. So you can see here the Confederates surround Cemetery Hill. Um, I can already tell here that the soldiers are not formed up exactly as we left them. But uh, you can see the next battle here. Um, the next battle is a follow-on fight and probably an attack on Cemetery Hill. But uh, that's enough for now. That's going to be the end of this video. I appreciate you tuning in uh, to part two of my Ultimate General uh, Let's Play and kind of storytelling, if you will, as I was talking about the 11th Corps there. I will continue kind of my talk uh, about that, uh, that the result of what happened to the 11th Corps as they got shipped out to the west, as well as playing in the, the next battle. So if that's something that you're interested in, learning a little bit about history, then uh, definitely tune in. And if you just enjoy the gameplay, tune in as well. Let me know what you think. You know, throw a like, throw a dislike, throw a comment. Let me know what you want to see. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you dislike. And uh, I will attempt to always make my, uh, my videos better. Uh, but that's enough of me rambling. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.